When building commenced at Dr. Stevens' hospital in 1720, there were few notable examples of monumental classical architecture in Dublin. Trinity College, which formed the eastern parameter of the city, presented a relatively modest scaled Dutch inspired front to College Green. The Royal Hospital at Kilmainham, which we already heard of today, then the most ambitious building in the city, was the first real foray into continental classicism. And this marked out the Western fringes. In between, we had the Thalsall or Merchants Hall and Skinner's Row, St. Werberg's and St. Anne's churches in Church in Dawson Street. These displayed an eclectic, some would say a little uncouth taste for Roman Baroque, then still something of a novelty in Dublin. By contrast, designs for the upper courtyard at Dublin Castle from the 1680s, the old customs house at Essex Bridge, again, which we have heard, from to, uh, heard about today from 1707, and perhaps most especially the former royal barracks um, now Collins's barracks presented a much more reserved uh, expression to the city, yet all derived from the same ancestry. We've heard from Elizabeth Ann about the death of these buildings to William Robinson's Royal Hospital at Kilmainham. You can see this in these large, rather plain a styler blocks, elaborated on occasion by a classical pediment or a cupola, often with a open loggia at the base and dormer windows in a high-pitched hipped roof. We've seen how Thomas Burr's plan of 1718 for Stevens's hospital follows this basic prototype. Indeed, according to Morris Craig, this is the last kick of the 17th century. Practical in planning, economic in its embellishments and the materials employed, like these earlier works, there's something safe tentative almost in the transitional nature of its classicism. Today, I'd like to explore some of the major building projects of the 1720s and see what happens to this picture. Focusing on two works at either end of the decade, we will chart the architectural innovations and changes which took place, discussing the skill, the ambition of the individuals involved, the materials and craft practices employed in bringing these works into being. Well, at the same time, we'll consider how these examples of our built heritage reflect the wider historical landscape in which they were created. One of the most important building projects underway in 1720 was Thomas Burr's new library at Trinity College. Construction had actually begun in 1712, but had halted in 1716 due to a lack of finance and the changing political climate paid for public funds granted by Parliament to ensure sound revolutionary principles. Its protracted course of construction follows the changes in politics in the college and beyond, and is therefore a very interesting uh, building to focus on. Described by William Thackeray as a fine, manly-shaped building of cut stone, this large masonry block with its emphasis on symmetry, balance and order heralds the advent of monumental classicism in the college. Yet, although we can label this classical in style, like several of the previous examples, it lacks a classical columnar order to articulate its facade, nor is there even a pediment or cupola here to mark out its upper registers. Only the Corinthian entablature above and the rusticated arcade below hint at its antique antecedents. This base or arcade was originally open, as we can see here, on both sides of the building. So you could walk through from Library Square to Fellows Gardens, which we can see here in the foreground. The tall proportions of the window openings are closer to 17th century examples, not dissimilar to those employed at Dr. Stevens's hospital. While originally a hipped roof and very tall chimney stacks protruded above the classical balustrade. Carved window surrounds, which we can just about make out in this image, are also classical in detail. But aside from these embellishments, the facade is treated in the most abbreviated ma manner. Now, this is something that we may lay at the door of its architect. This very severe, plain, ordinary style of architecture, which we've seen in some of Burr's earlier works. 
of course, as chief engineer and architect or chief engineer and surveyor general of the state, he was first and foremost a military engineer. Burr did, however, look to some sophisticated sources for his new library. The plan, which is the stress and axiality and symmetry, and a load-bearing spinal wall, which we can see here, ran the length of the building, was structurally daring. And like its elevation, it looked to continental classical models. By way of Britain, in particular, to Sir Christopher Wren's library at Trinity College in Cambridge. Internally, too, the upper chamber at Cambridge acted as a direct source for the, uh, for, for the treatment of the long room at Trinity College. Note here in this illustration, uh, this view by Malton of the late 18th century, we can still see the original strapwork ceiling in the long room, which of course was replaced by Dean and Woodward's magnificent barrel vault in the 19th century. The interiors of the long room at Trinity College really show us some fine examples of early Georgian craftsmanship and of the use of native building materials. The bookshelves, which we can see here, are set at right angles to the exterior walls, designed to protect the books from light and to maximize space. These shelves and the wainscot panelling around them were handcrafted by the master joiner, John Sitton, using Irish oak, seemingly from Wicklow, which was then in scarce supply. And the warm, rich effect of this hardwood timber, which we can see here has darkened significantly with age, just adds to the magnificence of this ambitious space. But if we're looking for ambition, it was really the scale of this building that broke new ground. At over 200 feet long and 40 feet wide, it is absolutely gigantic. We can see here how it dominated its surroundings. It even does still today. We've got to try and imagine how this building would have appeared in the early decades of the 18th century. I think it really creates a very dominant statement about the ambition of its patrons, the college, and of its builders. So too, if we consider the scale of the undertaking. The manpower required to construct a building of this size was immense. Scores of building craftsmen and their attending laborers, similar ideas that Elizabeth, Elizabeth Ann has drawn out in her presentation, were needed to prepare the site for building, erect the structure, and finish it inside and out. And here, Burr employed many of the same craftsmen who worked at Dr. Stevens' hospital. Francis Quinn, as we have heard, a rough mason and bricklayer. Moses Darley, the master mason and stonecutter. George Spike, Burr's friend and master plasterer. And Isaac Wills, whose son and he himself were employed at Stevens' hospital. The records of these individuals survive in Trinity College's muniments room, and they provide really fascinating detail about these craftsmen involved and about the investment in both labour and materials at the library. If we look at the surviving structure, the use of materials, I think, is particularly striking. We can see here uh, quite a distinct contrast between the plain, rather rudimentary profiles of the lower story of the arcaded base and the finely finished ashlar stone facade above. The rusticated arcade is built of relatively cheap local calf limestone, which was quarried in Parmistown in West Dublin. It was originally a brownish grey colour, but has blackened, you can see here, in places through pollution. Now, this rustic work at the base of the arcade, uh, by its nature, is, a ten is intended to look robust, but here its execution is a little too rough in places. You can see the very shallow square profiles of the joints or the channeling is unassured, even confused in places. And according to Dr. McParland, the geometry is off. Now, this was a relatively novel treatment in Dublin at this time, but Burr, or rather his masons, had employed it more successfully in the loggia of the barracks. So we might therefore be tempted to lay the blame on the craftsmen in question. In this instance, Moses Darley and his son Henry, 
stonecutters of English descent who had recently arrived in Dublin from County Down, where they had carried on the stone, uh, stone quarrying business. Yet, in Darley's defence, the material itself does not lend itself to carved detail. We can see here how this muddy river bedded calp limestone has deteriorated very badly in places. The upper stories, by contrast, are treated with much more finesse. They were originally finished in a pale sandstone from Whitehaven in Cumbria, off the co west coast of England. In 1714, College Muniments record 38 tons of this costly building material were sourced in quarries around St. Bees at Whitehaven and brought to Dublin by the Irish mason, John Winery. Now this Whitehaven stone had a beautiful fine grained finish and it really lent itself to carved detail, but it was not really suitable for the Dublin environment or climate. The sandstone failed within decades and all save parts of the entablature block disintegrated and had to be replaced by local hard wearing granite later in the century. Looking at the facade today, it really seems like a building of two parts. So how do we account for this disjunction? Was this very visible break part of the original intention, the original design, or does it point to a change in direction during the course of the building or to a more ad hoc process? Simple answer is we don't know. But if we think about the broader context of the build, we might come up with a plausible explanation. When building commenced at the library, we've heard about this earlier on, the Tories were in power under Queen Anne. The college provost, Benjamin Pratt, was a staunch Tory. A couple of years into the build, in 1714, the House of Hanover succeeded to the British throne, and with it, the Whig faction gained control of parliamentary politics. Having executed the lower levels of the library, building funds dried up. Funds which we have noted were granted by Parliament and the Whig government were disinclined to help the Tory provost out. The construction halted until a new Whig provost was appointed in 1717 and suddenly additional funds were granted by Parliament. Building recommenced in what can only be seen as a more grand manner. I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but clearly, as Patrick has already noted, money matters and I would say materials matter. Moving on and throwing our gaze slightly wider, the 1720s saw significant changes to Dublin city plan, particularly north of the river. We can see here in a later map by John Roke. Here, the property speculator, Luke Gardner, was busy transforming the former lands of St. Mary's Abbey, building high-class housing developments, such as Henrietta Street and later Sackville Street. Aside from this, there were few public building projects of note in the mid-1720s. The Corn Market House in Thomas Street, 1727, followed established precedents, as did Burr's Linen Hall off Bolton Street, finished the following year. Again, we're looking at safe, somewhat pedestrian affairs. None of these works could prepare us for what would emerge at the end of the decade. Throughout the 1720s, there have been increasingly audible murmurings in the corridors of power about the unsuitable accommodation offered in the parliamentary buildings, which were then housed in Chichester House in College Green. 1727, the building committee granted £6,000 to build a new parliament house and plans were sought for the same. The details of what followed are a story for another day. Suffice to say, Poor Tom Burr was passed over, and the job was given to a young, relatively unknown architect who was certainly unproven. The foundation stone for the new Parliament House was laid on the 3rd of February, 1728-29, old style. Uh, and two years later, the building was not yet finished. Parliament was in situ. It was the earliest large-scale neo-Palladian building in the British Isles, and the world's first purpose-built bicameral Parliament House, Pierce's plan was both pioneering in form and in function. And it was the first in a series of landmark buildings which would transform Dublin during the 18th century. 
Looking at the building today, the architectural achievement speaks for itself. Facing College Green, we have this deep colonnade of forecourt, flanked by two monumental porticos, which provided processional entrances to the Lords and the Commons. 22 giant ionic columns are built of creamy white Portland stone from the Isle of Portland off the Dorset coast. As is the crisply carved entablature and sculpted pediment above. While the robust Wicklow granite walling behind and contrasting blocks of dressed ashlar above and V-jointed rustication below create the perfect foil. Here for the first time in Dublin, we find this marriage of imported English limestone and native Irish granite, a combination which would set the standard in Dublin's uh, public buildings for a hundred years to come. The Parliament House brought high international classicism to Dublin, and one of the major challenges for its architect was finding a skilled workforce trained in this new architectural language. And we see in the um, records of the Parliament and the Journal of the Irish House of Commons how Pierce, alongside local artisans such as the mason Nathaniel Winery, the plaster of William Spencer, whose fathers both worked under Thomas Burr, and the carver John Houghton, who executed the beautiful Scamozzi and Ionic capitals, which we can see here. Pierce also brought in some new men, the migrants, such as David discussed earlier, seemingly from England to execute its novel elements. We have Thomas Gilbert, a mason from the Isle of Portland, whose family held the contract to supply Portland stone to St. Paul's Cathedral. William Borrowdale, another of the principal stone cutters, who seems to have had connections to Whitehaven in Cumbria. And Joe Benser, a carpenter from Coventry, who came to Dublin in the mid 1720s and established one of the principal building dynasties of the later 18th century. Just as at Trinity Library, the building of this new parliament was a major financial undertaking. Over the course of the initial two-year build, just shy of £20,000 of the Exchequer's money had been expended, with an additional £6,000 needed to finish the work. The results, however, spoke volumes about the confidence of the Irish Parliament at this time, who used this magnificent building as a very visible assertion of their growing power and their desire for legislatory independence. These same ideas play out internally. Although much altered, we can still get a glimpse of the ambition of this space. Its regular plan, which we can see here, was somewhat skewed as the site was hemmed in by existing buildings. Yet the arrangement of space tells us about who the real decision makers were. We can see the commons located here along the central axis of the building easily accessible through the series of interconnected spaces. It really takes center stage. The House of Lords, by contrast, although in political and ceremonial terms was the upper chamber, was shunted to the side, approached along a tunnel of top-lit corridors. So here we see the political reality being made architecturally explicit. For a start, the Commons won out in numbers, some 300 odd MPs to 149 peers. While the major movers behind this project, including the architect and his patron, William Speaker Connolly, who Patrick was, and David have discussed already, were members of the Commons. But although the House of Lords was compromised in terms of position, this was still a very sophisticated and scholarly space, which draws on direct antique precedent by way of Andrea Palladio, and is one of the finest surviving early Georgian interiors in the city or indeed the country, I would say. Divided into three parts, the bar, the house and the throne, we find a masterly display of proportional control and classical rhetoric, a showcase of native craft skill and materials. From the really warm, rich Irish oak used in the wainscoting by John Armstead, the coffered stucco work by William Spencer, to the checkered tiles of Kilkenny limestone interspersed with Portland stone flags in the outside of the throne, all originally offset against crimson upholstery trimmed in gold lace. This space still today omits an air of classical elegance. The Commons, however, was the real centrepiece of Pierce's plan. The precocious space, 
centralized octagonal chamber with a squat dome above. Its stepped seating, upholstered originally in green silk and paraben cloth, looked the terraced Hellenist of temple forms and, and directly related to its function, supposedly providing good acoustics for the members and visibility of the speaker from all sides. Regretfully, it no longer survives. It was destroyed by fire in 1792, caused by a faulty flu in the dome. The space was rebuilt, but later converted into the cash office of the Bank of Ireland in the early 1800s. And yet, by marshalling surviving evidence, we can virtually recreate a sense of the original architectural splendor of this lost space. And we can see clearly the power of such buildings to evoke a sense of the time in which they were created, to provide us with a snapshot of Dublin in the late 1720s. Thank you.